Welcome to Fun and Games Side Quests. Every episode is a different host sharing a video game they love and why they love it. Hello everyone, my name is Brennan Groom and I'll be your host for this episode of Side Quests. A little bit about me before we get into it. I am the host of the Path to Controller podcast, which is a weekly show where we talk about the latest in video games and nerd culture, as well as the editor for PathToController.io, where you can find a lot of our written content, as well as reviews, interviews, and editorials on things going on in nerd culture and video games. Uh, you can find me personally at Groom, where I talk a lot about video games, my cat, beer, and who knows what else. So if that sounds like something that's your cup of tea, feel free to check all of that out. But the game that I wanted to talk about today is a game that is very, very special to me, and that is The Messenger. Um, for those of you who aren't aware of what this game is, it's an indie game developed by a studio out of Canada called Sabotage Studio. And when I first discovered this game, it was, I believe, during a Nintendo Indie World Direct. Uh, actually, at that time, it may have not have been called Indie World and just have been an indie, a Nindy Direct. But regardless, when I saw it, I mean, you have a game that's, you know, gorgeous looking pixelated graphics with great music. You already have my attention, so it doesn't take too much to get my attention from that. But this game looked great from what they showed. And I then later had a chance to play it for the first time at PAX East in 28, the beginning of 2018. And during that encounter, I actually got to play it with the creator of the game, Thierry Boulanger, who, when him and I sat down to play with it, it there was a lot of things that we talked about with that game. And at the time, you know, they were only showing off a very brief portion of the game, but him and I kind of hit it off so well, and we, we I was really enjoying the game, where he asked me if I wanted to see some later game stuff that uh, they weren't really showing in the floor, and I wasn't really allowed to talk about it at the time in, in any of the coverage we were putting up, but, you know, he he was feeling how I was feeling about it, so I was like, yeah, absolutely, and he warned me, like, hey, there's going to be, you know, some light spoilers for later game things, and I'm like, I... I need to see this. Like, I can't not see this for you bringing it up. And it just kind of cemented me being really excited about this game. And the thing with The Messenger to me is it's one of those games, and I'll, I'll kind of back my claims up as we get through this episode, but it's one of those games that when I discovered it and played it at PAX East in 2018, it hit me the way the first time I played and saw Shovel Knight hit me where Shovel Knight to me is is like a pillar of indie games and platforming in general. I mean, I think I think for a long time, the Shovel Knight, and still is, I, I would say, is a benchmark for indie platformers and just platformers in general. And when I had the chance to play The Messenger, when it fully released later in 2018, I think The Messenger then became that type of benchmark where if you're trying to make an indie platform or just a platformer in general, if you're not hitting the bars that Shovel Knight and now The Messenger have set, I think you need to maybe go back and rework some of your mechanics or other, other uh, you know, parts of the game that may not be up to snuff. So when I had the chance to play it and, and you know, had those feelings, I was a little nervous because I was very hyped up on this game. I was very, very looking, much looking forward to it. And, you know, how can something that I'm this hyped up for ever live up to my expectations. And I think not only did it live up to those expectations when I finally got to play the full game, I think it somehow surpassed them, which is not an easy thing to do. And the other thing about The Messenger too is it's, you know, it came out in 2018 where there were a lot of really good indie games that came out. You know, you had Celeste that was winning a bunch of awards and getting a lot of acclaim. You had games like Dead Cells that I know it, you know, initially released, you know, in a years prior in early access on PC, I believe, but it got its full release across all platforms uh, on in 2018. So it became, you know, I would, I would consider that a 2018 release. And you had those two games that were getting a lot of the spotlight. And to me, having played all three, you know, I love Celeste, I love Dead Cells, but The Messenger, I think was for me easily the best game that came out in 2018, the game I enjoyed the most for sure. And a game that I think about and, you know, recommend constantly since. And I still think it's a game that, you know, if you haven't played, you should definitely take the time. It's it's available at this point. I think when it initially launched in 2018, it was only on Steam and Switch, but it should be available on everything right now. It might even still be on Xbox Game Pass. I know it was at one point, but that's definitely a game that you should absolutely seek out if if platformers and, you know, light Metroidvanias are your thing. I think this is uh, 
something that is definitely in the conversation and needs to be played. But, you know, I'm talking all these these fantastical things about a game and not really talking about the game too much itself. So I guess I can I can do that for a little bit too, if you're if you're interested in what the messenger is all about and why I speak so highly of it, outside of the fact that I just love to champion indie games when I can. So the messenger, you know, when you're making a platformer, I think that the two main things, especially, you know, something that's, you know, stylized and a retro aesthetic, I think the two main important things to, to catch people and to get people invested is it needs to have good controls. It needs to feel tight. It needs to feel responsive. If you're jumping and it doesn't feel right, if you're trying to grab a ledge and it doesn't feel right, if you're trying to, you know, attack enemies and it doesn't feel right, that's going to that's gonna linger throughout the game and it's going to, you know, hinder your experience or maybe hinder you even finishing the game. So, you know, at that being said, visually, the game is stunning. Um, and control-wise, I think that there are very few games that feel as tight as this to me. Like, this feels like it is a AAA polished uh, you know, has a, an abundant amount of resources and money behind it to, to make sure the time was spent to make sure that it controls as good as it does. You know, anytime that you die in the game, because the game isn't necessarily easy. It is definitely has some challenging moments, especially if you want to 100% the game, uh, collect everything and, and whatnot. It definitely has some challenging moments and areas, but I feel like they're they're balanced because the gameplay is so tight, where when you die you know, nine times out of 10, if not 10 out of 10 times, you know, it's by your error and not necessarily because, you know, there was some sort of issue. You didn't grab a ledge. You didn't bounce off an enemy when you were trying to, you know, glide through or, or what have you. So I definitely, I definitely feel like, you know, when it comes to a game that is polished in controls, this is, this is a 10 out of 10 in that aspect. I think this game is a 10 out of 10 regardless. There are some things that, you know, and no, no game is perfect. You know, games can be masterpieces without being perfect because I don't think anything is perfect. But this, this game to me is definitely a masterpiece. Uh, and the controls definitely, you know, back that claim up for me. And then, you know, the visuals, the visuals are, you know, very special to me because if you... If you know anything about the messenger, even without playing it, you probably at least know that there's what some might say is a gimmick where the game is in the beginning stages, it's in 8-bit, and then at some point there's a transition to 16-bit graphics. Uh, they also transition the music to 16-bit when you go into that style. Um, but it's not just a gimmick. I mean, sure, it, it's a cool visual uh, you know, thing that can can be considered that but they make sure to tie this whole change from 16-bit to 18-bit back and forth oh, i'm sorry 8-bit back and forth um is that there's a lot of story elements that are revolved revolve around that and i am still kind of shocked to this day that the story in the messenger is actually phenomenal and the writing and the some of the character development and some of the character uh you know dialogue is is so well written that i think i, I don't want to really talk about spoiler stuff because i think that if you have an interest in this game you should enjoy it for what it is and maybe you do know what the what the twist is and, and you know maybe it's not that that crazy of a twist but i, I like to leave the spoilers off the table for this type of discussion and kind of just talk overall about some of the the game uh, on, on a broader sense that way if you do which i hope you do end up seeking this game out afterwards you you enjoy your time with it and get to experience it you know with with as much blindness as as i did going in uh, well i guess not as much as i did because i had some of it revealed to me in, in, at pax east like i had mentioned earlier but when you get to that moment where the where the game opens up this 16-bit uh, situation for you so up until that point actually we'll, we'll stick with the 8-bit for now when you're playing through the 8-bit part of the game it seems very linear it's much more platforming uh you know kind of just seems like a like a like a ninja guide an s game like a shinobi game where you're on a path and you're going this way and you're just moving through but when you get to that moment when things change when the the story gives you the reasoning why it's changing and you start going into the 16-bit version of the game it then opens up the ability to go back and forth between those two styles because again the i guess the the very very light part of this that i can say that's you know not really a spoiler is that the transition between 8-bit and 16-bit is is like a time travel mechanic um which then changes not just the game from 8-bit to 16-bit stylized 
uh, it changes the type of game it is. So when you're going into 16-bit, it then opens this game up to be a little bit more of a Metroidvania where you're going back to areas you've already been to, where you're, you know, looking for things in, in past areas, you're, you're you know, backtracking a decent amount to, to find certain things. And now that you have this ability going through time, you're able to, uh, you know, see see certain areas and see certain things in, in a different way that you couldn't see in when you were in 8-bit. So I enjoy that a lot. I, you know, I I think I would have personally been fine with it too, even if it didn't connect it to a story and it was just a mechanic in the game. But I think the, you know, Sabotage Studio taking that extra step to make it more meaningful to me is even better, uh, even though I don't think it necessarily needed to have that. But I think that that makes it an even better mechanic that it's, you know, tied into the, to the story of the game, to the lore of the game. Um, so that was really cool in my opinion. I think for someone who who loves video games with good music too. The thing that's cool when you switch between the two dimensions is that the the music also, the, the soundtrack, which is a fantastic soundtrack uh, made by Rainbow Dragon Eyes, is, is a soundtrack that there's basically all of the game in 8-bit style and then all of that same music redone in 16-bit using the tools that you know would be accessible to people making games at that time so they're very true to true to their what they're trying to pay homage to so i really enjoy the music you know across the game one little thing about the music that stood out to me that i i loved so much and it's a little thing but it's just something i like to mention when you go underwater in certain sections of the game the music also reflects that and it gets like sort of muffled as if you were underwater yourself listening to the music. And it, it's something small. It's not, it's just a little detail, but it's really cool to me. Like I, I like that just little attention to detail that, that, you know, didn't need to be there, but the fact that it's there is, is just, you know, it's something cool. It's something special um, to get back to the story too. You know, the story does a lot of interesting things and I, I resonated with me a lot and I, I enjoyed what was there. And like I said, I didn't necessarily need that to be there, but I, I'm very happy with the fact that they, you know, made this very, very interesting story and world and characters. Uh, the two, probably the two most memorable characters to me are the shopkeeper and Corbel. So like I said before, this is a, a sort of challenging game at times and you, you definitely will die often. And when you die, you have this little companion uh, with you named Corbel, who every time you die and get a death screen, he has like, you know, a little quip to say to you. And it's, it, it, it's funny. Like it, the writing on those parts are, are pretty good. I've, I screenshotted them on my switch far too often, probably shared them far too often when I was playing the game in 2018, but th those moments were great. And then the shopkeeper who you run into a lot, he's, he's a pretty important aspect of the story. He pushes the story along for you and he, you know, he helps you, obviously he sells you things and, and whatnot, but he, he has a lot of lore things as well that you can, you know, optionally choose to go through with him. Um, but a lot of the things that he does and says are, are pretty great and he's very well written. And I think, you know, just another layer of this game has so many facets to it that I think if you removed all those things, it would still be a great game. Like, I still think that if it was just this very polished platformer, Metroidvania, that had really good controls and great style and great music... It would be a great game, but the fact that it has all of this other stuff, great writing, great story, uh, you know, it ties the, the mechanics, you know, that big mechanic into the story in the world. I think that stuff is what pushes this over the limit to being a masterpiece, being a benchmark um, for, you know, anyone else looking to make this style of game. Uh, definitely for me makes it something very special. But yeah, I mean, I don't want to dip too much into the story specifically just because I feel like it's something that could you know, I, I, it could offer a little bit of twists, a little bit of, you know, we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to talk about the story in depth just because I don't want to, to spoil anything potentially for someone who may want to experience this without knowing too much about what's going on. But for me, like I had said through and through, this is a game that I think is the, you know, current benchmark for platformers. It's definitely one of the greatest games I have ever played. I would put it on my top 10 list of video games, definitely in my top 10 list of indie games for sure. Um, and it's something that I think, you know, like I said, if you like platformers, if you like Metroidvanias, I think this is a game that you should absolutely seek out. Um, it's available pretty much everywhere that you can play games, um, maybe not mobile, but it should be on all of the major uh, consoles as well as uh, PCs. So if you have any interest in the messenger, if you want to take my word for it, 
I will put my stamp on this saying that it is by far one of the best games I've ever played and something that will stay with me for a very, very long time. And if you end up loving The Messenger, that same studio, Sabotage Studio, is working on a new game that is set in the universe of The Messenger, but it's a different type of game. It's an RPG called Sea of Stars. Uh, I don't think it has a release date yet, but if you do love The Messenger like I do, you can look forward to checking out Sea of Stars in the future and get more of that delicious uh, world, because let me tell you, I love it. And you know what? Similar, sim- it's funny because in 2018, Celeste, Dead Cells, and The Messenger all came out. And then, I believe it all happened in the same year too, all three of those games got free updates that added additional content. So for The Messenger, there's a there's an additional, you know, little campaign called Picnic Panic that's more story, more levels, you know, more more to that game. Uh, and it's if you download The Messenger, if you already have The Messenger, you have that for free. So there's a lot more game there uh, than, than what initially was already there, which was already, you know, a good, beefy game that I highly, highly recommend. And if you have any issues with The Messenger, I can't help you because I love it. And I think it's, it's it, like I said, over and over, it's one of the best games that I've ever played. And I hope you do check it out. And that's, that's all I got to say about The Messenger. Uh, if you want to keep up with me or you want to talk to me about The Messenger, you can check me out at bgroom on Twitter or listen to our podcast. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Happy gaming. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't Screen Beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential Screen Beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? what? That's... No, that's not... Can I call them Screen Beans now? Fine. Screen Beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole Screen Beans now. You will be mine. Aurora. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.